Exciting session. Our first speaker of this session is Lara Zolacek from UCLA. Um, she's going to talk to us about QKD. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the introduction. Thank you, organizers, for a wonderful week here at the Simons. Uh, so today I will talk about information reconciliation in quantum key distribution protocols uh, and uh, probably aspects of this talk will be very familiar to some of you and I'll touch upon some of the uh, concepts we have already seen in particular earlier today and so it will be a bit in the spirit of what we have uh, talked about at the workshop today and hopefully uh, some of this work uh, will, might even serve to inspire uh, some of you who work uh, in this domain as well. This is joint work with my PhD students, Deborah Mitra and Lev Taus and Murat uh, Jayant at uh, UCLA. And this some of this work is also done in co collaboration with Professor Chi Wei Wong. All right, so this is the overview, uh, this is the outline. So uh, first I will introduce um, the concept of quantum key distribution. Uh, we've uh, heard uh, several talks yesterday on uh, quantum error correction. So this also has the quantum attribute in it, but you do not need to have any background in quantum error correction uh, to work on this, um, on this uh, type of problem. So it's really uh, more of a classical problem that is motivated by the uh, new uh, so it's a much lower barrier to entry uh, for people with a background in um, classical channel coding. So um, we are in particular excited about the new type of codes that we have recently developed, which we are they are, are optimized non-binary LDPC codes for quantum key distribution. So that's the a majority of my talk. But I will also, given the audience, I'm also excited to share with you another recent result that we have that is sort of an alternative approach to how to deal with this. So, um, all right, so let me get started. Let's do an overview of what a quantum key distribution represents. So, uh, as you know, quantum communications, this is something that's been in the news a lot. It's now everything is quantum. So, uh, um, uh, this, there is a reason for this, a broad excitement for this. So, uh, quantum key distribution is um, um, offers a secure way for effectively sharing a private encryption key using a quantum communication channel, and that can even be done in the presence of Eve. So you have, to, sorry, you have two entities, Alice and Bob, and you have an eavesdropper, which we call Eve, uh, that uh, might be um, able to listen into some of the conversations here in, which are of course, represented by bits. Um, and nonetheless, uh, they should still be able to um, securely communicate uh, this key that they can then use for other purposes. All right, so um, what is a QKD protocol? It has two steps. It has a quantum step where the um, raw keys are generated and that is done in the uh, quantum setting. So this is where our colleagues who are working in quantum photonics really uh, contribute um, with their breakthroughs and do it very in a really good way. Um, so uh, they use this quantum channel to generate a set of raw keys. But given the imperfections in the system, these uh, raw keys may disagree at certain positions. And so then, and now we are back into the land of the things we are comfortable with, which is um, dealing with errors. So in classical step, we do post-processing of raw keys, and uh, this involves communication over a public channel. And here we have two things. We have information reconciliation, which is where we would use error correction to reconcile these raw keys, and then privacy amplification, because not only do we have errors, we also have presence of Eve, uh, whose, um, uh, whose activities we want to minimize. Um, so uh, um, in, in the end, we want them to, Alice and Bob, to agree on their uh, secret keys. And so a majority of the effort today will be on uh, improving this information reconciliation using uh, novel uh, coding schemes. All right, so what has, been, what has emerged recently is a very practical and sort of high um, promise uh, QKD protocol is something called energy time. Um, and it works like this. So we have a photon uh, generator on the left. And these entangled photon pairs are um, emitted to Alice and Bob. So Alice and Bob each receive uh, one element from the pair. And so they timestamp the arrival times. And so the uh, x-axis here is simply a time. And then you partition this um, 
time axis into frames, and then moreover, we partition each frame into bits. And so this has um, generated a lot of excitement because it holds the promise of being able to generate multiple bits per entangled photo. Uh, and so this now looks very familiar to us from coming from the coding or communications background is um, uh, this time binning or um, pulse modulation type scheme. And uh, so this is what we have now. So Alice and Bob have different arrivals uh, that they uh, record. So let's say X for Alice and Y for Bob. And as we already mentioned, uh, they may not be identical for a variety of reasons, including jitter, dark counts, photon losses, and so forth. And uh, there's other quantum effects here that uh, we need to take into account. And so overall, we model this as a QKD channel, which is a um, statistical relationship between Y and X here. And so um, in information reconciliation, you have uh, X has, uh, Alice has its own sequence X, which is this discretized timestamps, Y has its own sequence Y, and then they perform communication over a public uh, channel to reconcile X and Y, and in the end, they arrive at these keys, which ideally should be the same for us. And so in order, because we are now uh, in business of overcoming errors, uh, so we are going to use error correcting codes for that. And um, uh, what this talk will be about is how this error correction schemes can play a role uh, in this uh, QKD scheme. Um, here. So uh, have, we have two approaches that we are excited about. So um, I will first describe our optimized non-binary LDPC codes for QKD. And our first result is um, heavily depends on our uh, um, physical modeling of our channel, which, as I said, is done in collaboration with our um, uh, co um, colleagues at UCLA. Uh, and so we um, uh, um, utilize channel characteristics to optimize non-binary LDPC codes to maximize the secret key rate from uh, in the information reconciliation. And then our second approach is uh, to uh, step away a little bit from uh, the details of the channel itself, but um, uh, kind of take a different look at uh, code design uh, in light of the fact that at the end of information reconciliation, we still need to do privacy amplification step. So we are called this privacy amplification aware LDPC code design, and interestingly enough, they open up a number of interesting coding questions uh, that are um, that have previously not been explored. So we are quite excited about that. All right, so um, let's get started uh, with the uh, okay, yes. No, I said you said to reconcile the two streams. Uh, it doesn't have to do it completely. Does that mean that the two would still have errors between the streams? Ideally not. Ideally, ideally not. Okay, so uh, some details are forthcoming. Yes. All right, so let's take a closer look. So um, uh, since we're going to do coding, a uh, well-known coding scheme for this would be uh, to use a powerful code. And so a powerful code of choice is going to be a non-binary LDPC code. The reason for that is that, and I, as I will explain in a little bit, binary has already been looked at. So we want to see how much can we squeeze if we go from binary to non-binary, which is a natural uh, thing to consider knowing that we know that the binary should offer uh, benefits over non-binary. Okay, so this is what happens. So this is a, um, we don't know, there is no coding in the sense of um, like this is, a, this is not a code word. What Alice sees is, is what Alice, the, the, these are the arrival times. So what we really do, if we send syndromes, uh, X times H as to Bob, and then uh, where H for us will be um, an appropriate parity check matrix. It can be over a non-binary uh, field of size uh, two to the Q, and then Bob uh, figures out what X is based on the syndrome that he sees uh, value uh, and his own information Y and what is known about the statistical properties of the channel, and then eventually they should be the same. So what we're interested in here is the information reconciliation rate, which itself depends on three things. It depends on the field size Q, so uh, it depends on the... Um, so it will simply be one if it's binary, one minus the FER, and then uh, the rate of the code, which uh, parity check matrix is of size um, n by n. 
And so what is actually interesting here is that this information reconciliation rate will both depend on the coding rate and FER of the code. So this is an interesting plot for us. So it's not a monotonic function in the, um, in the FER. So it's not like better code is always dom dominates because of this um, kind of balancing that we need to perform. And so as you can see, um, information reconciliation rate, which is the curves in the um, in blue, they have like the sort of peak at a certain at certain point. So it's not a non-monotonic dependence. And that is something that we want to take a closer look at. And this is true. Yes, yes. So, so this is a known formula for the information reconciliation rate because we need to take into account the fact that when FER is not strictly zero, we have to, we have to abort. So this is this is where we cannot proceed. Does this assume you can detect the frame rate? So you throw away the Yes, frame yes, you take you take a frame. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Away yes. Frame. Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. Um so as you can see here, another thing that is worth mentioning is that uh, for these systems, uh, maximum will uh, occur at a relatively high values of FER. So this is not something that in other domains we've seen, certainly, certainly not in storage. Uh, so this also opens up um, sort of an opportunity for different type of code design uh, questions uh, relative to what we have done before. All right, so as I mentioned already, the reason that we wanted to take a closer look at how well non-binary does is of course, there was a prior work on binary that by and large was considered state-of-the-art prior to this work, and it goes as follows. So in the binary LDPC code, and they called this scheme multi-level coding, so MLC for short, what happens is that, remember, we want to have, um, uh, we are partitioning the time axis into frames, and frames are partitioned into bins. You have a certain number of bins, let's say two to the Q bins per frame, and so as a result, we can have qubits, um, qubits, so, uh, so it's two to the Q um, bins per frame in this case. And so um, uh, the way they have done it, they would reconcile each of these Q layers using binary LDPC code. Namely, you have a certain number of them over here, and then um, for each of these layers that I, um, uh, uh, they operate independently at this point, uh, you have a separate parity check matrix, and then uh, you use that to decode. You have estimates, uh, you use uh, that information, and you, do, and you go and um, do that for all of your uh, layers. It's a multi-layer scheme. So, of course, the advantage here is that since we are using a binary uh, approach uh, re in relative terms, this would be of lower complexity and faster decoding, um, and that also is, of course, important for uh, key generation. So, um, the way this was originally proposed is that we would have sequential decoding amongst layers. So, you decode one layer, then the next layer, then the next layer. And so um, since we already know that non-binary in principle would offer advantages over uh, binary schemes, uh, it is um, reasonable to uh, uh, have uh, non-binary codes, LDPC codes that would be simply stronger codes. And so we do anticipate higher uh, information reconciliation rates on the account of using non-binary. But of course, just like in other settings, um, there could be a higher com uh, decoding complexity when the symbol sizes are large. And so um, what we have attempted to do in this work is to kind of take best of both worlds uh, so that we do inherit a strong error correction of non-binary whilst not fully succumbing to the high complexity of the fully non-binary scheme. So we have um, introduced a flexible protocol which we call non-binary multi-level coding, and it is a bit of a mouthful. So we have a parameter A uh, um, that I will describe in a moment what that means. And so um, what essentially what is going on, so you have a choice of simply binary scheme that will operate on a per bit level. Then you have a choice, this is prior work, you have a choice of fully non-binary, which the field size will correspond to the number of bins per frame, so as, as non-binary as you want to be. But perhaps there is some way of being in the middle while reaping the benefits from both schemes. And so this is essentially what our scheme does. So we have this parameter A, and so this scheme will subsume binary if we set the parameter A to 1, and it will subsume fully non-binary if we set parameter A equals to Q, but as it turns out, the best choice is something in between. 
And then uh, in addition, we have, uh, we also have an improvement on the decoding scheme um, where uh, we actually do what we refer to as interleaved decoding amongst layers to improve the uh, information reconciliation. So this is how the protocol works. Um, uh, so um, really is a question of uh, splitting this uh, representation um, of zeros and ones into uh, uh, some other symbols. So it need not be fully non-binary. So if we have Q as two to the Q is the number of bins, Q is A times B plus R. So um, we split this representation into B symbols that are over one non-binary field, call it uh, GF two to the A, and then one, excuse me, symbol that is in GF two to the R, and then we apply layered uh, reconciliation on these split symbols, just like here. And so this is where we start. So we start with a few symbols that are on in a non-binary field, albeit the field itself is not of that biggest possible size, something smaller, but not necessarily. And so we create its own uh, syndromes. We proceed here, and then we use that uh, uh, sequentially to decode at this point. And so this is what we do. And so this is a matter of uh, what one choice that we have made here is how we represent the data. We don't have to represent it binary. We don't have to represent it fully non-binary. We believe that there is a better choice that lies in between. And so this becomes now information reconciliation rate, where we sum it up over all choices of our representation. All right, so uh, uh, as a next ingredient uh, in uh, looking at the prior work, uh, that um, initial binary scheme that was proposed by Jules and co-authors is utilizes uh, simple binary uh, codes. So of course, there's other tools in our toolbox, so let's use them uh, by looking, for example, at irregular LDPC codes. Um, and so of course, we can, uh, uh, leverage that what we know in other domains, how we can go about improving uh, codes here as well. So one, one option is to uh, look at the irregular LDPC codes. And so we want to optimize now our um, degree distributions with the objective of increasing the information reconciliation rates. And so uh, for that, we actually uh, were inspired by early results um, uh, using differential evolution uh, where originally this was done to um, uh, optimize parity check the degrees associated with the parity check given parity check matrix uh, uh, with respect to some uh, performance metric which we call here performance predictor so what has traditionally been done is that this performance predictor is the core threshold um, and uh, then we are looking that for a fixed rate r but what we are looking at here is a um, slightly different metric given our setup, and it goes like this. So uh, we are looking at the uh, channel itself, which can be, uh, we are looking at these conditional probabilities that are themselves derived from our empirical QKD channel. And so our performance predictor is a slightly different quantity than what had been used in the past precisely because of uh, what is the final metric that we are uh, interested in. So with that in mind, um, we have a different uh, degree distributions than what you would have in traditional setting. And remember, this is not a monotonic um, uh, dependency on the FER. And so our uh, metric uh, with respect to which we are optimizing things has changed. And so that will result in a different degree distribution. And something that uh, works, for, excuse me, works for us here is that this is high FER regime, so things can be uh, computed through Monte Carlo uh, simulations. All right, so um, the next thing is, is that what I mentioned before, the original scheme, which uh, has been broadly considered in, in the uh, various implementations, the binary scheme, uh, was looking at the multiple layers and uh, one, Potential issue is that um, when you uh, decode one level and if something might go wrong, then that sort of stays with you and that is uh, that the uh, sequential decoding um, error will negatively impact the performance in subsequently. Um, and so um, there is a, uh, one of the previous works uh, uh, looked at the uh, interactive communication uh, between the two entities to mitigate this uh, error propagation, um, uh, and the decoding uh, at this point 
is a verified uh, can be verified using uh, simple hashes. So you, you we use hash for um, in this domain to um, verify or to conclude that things have been decoded correctly. Um, and if this verification step fails, and then what happens? Uh, Alice simply gives up and then sends the actual symbol for the subsequent decoding. So we do not use that uh, part of the decoding towards our information rate, but simply as an aid for the next step. So that was uh, one potential way of overcoming this error propagation. Um, but in any case, this is all done in a sequential way. Um, so we still uh, do not have a sort of catastrophic issue, but uh, th uh, there, is no, there is no way of going back. So what we have um, introduced as a next idea is to use uh, uh, subsequent layers to decode some of the previous layers. Uh, so we don't use up all of our resources at once. So we just use a few decoding iterations to begin with uh, and uh, see if that is sufficient some number delta, um, uh, delta one. And so uh, uh, you, we don't use that the entire decoding budget. Uh, sorry, this is a little bit. Um, all right. Um, let me see if I can put this in the right place first. Um, oops. Uh, OK. Uh, right, so uh, what this figure shows is that we are not using up all the decoding iteration budgets at once because we don't want to give up on that information that is uh, presented in a given layer. So we essentially just do a little bit of a split. Oops. So we do a little bit of a split so that uh, even if we are, so let's say we are successful in a subsequent layer, that information can still be used uh, as needed to decode um, the layers that we have already visited. Um, so with that, we have our results. Um, so this is our new scheme, which we called an NBMLCA protocol because of this parameter A. And so as I said, it subsumes both uh, binary uh, and fully non-binary schemes. So this is the fully, uh, this is the binary scheme on the left. And as I mentioned already, this scheme has been very popular in practice when we talk to our colleagues who are on the implementation side, they have really been a fan of this scheme. So they are certainly welcome any improvements that one may have. Uh, so this is was the first thing to consider, which is the fully non-binary. And then as you can see, uh, the uh, what is actually kind of gets best of both worlds, uh, which is the that separation of the representation that is neither binary, non fully non-binary, but something in between when we are using uh, uh, non-binary representation over fields that are smaller than the uh, the number of dense representations. All right, so this is some performance comparisons here. Um, so what we are showing is picture on the left is um, so. The idea is that we want to increase the uh, number of uh, bits per photon. So we, the, that's why the rate is more than one. So it's not a general coding rate. Um, and so our scheme is, uh, uh, so it's the one on the, in the blue on the top. And as you can see, uh, it performs um, significantly better than uh, both the binary and the non-binary and the previous um, uh, state of the art. And then here we also see benefits on the right using our new, uh, what we call interleaving So we see benefits both on the code representation, data representation, as well as new um, decoding, um, uh, decoding approaches. Um, and just putting this overall, this is sort of the best that can be done uh, using prior work, which are the curves at the bottom uh, in, um, in dashed, and then a choice of our curves are on, on the top. Um, so benefits here, uh, I should also mention, this is with respect to a real channel. So this channel has been modeled uh, by our colleagues over at UCLA. So this is... Um, this is as real as you can have. So these are pretty um, significant uh, results because we uh, have um, um, done this in the context of um, those, um, uh, those real, uh, real implementations. And so uh, uh, the result is that we have about 40 to 60% improvement relative to the in that have been using previously. All right, so at this point, I'd like to uh, slightly switch gears. This is a new problem for us. Uh, we are looking at 
essentially using a better coding scheme for uh, quantum key distribution. So what we have learned thus far is that certainly and not surprisingly, non-binary outperforms binary, but there is room for improvement. And in fact, how we organize the information, even in the non-binary regime, um, there is uh, ways to do it in a way that is unique to the setting. So in the traditional setting, you know, as you increase the non-binary field size, the performance gets better. And so we have, yes. So does X also know the conditional distribution P of Y given X, or only uh, the decoder knows? Only the decoder knows. Um, right. So, uh, uh, so as we know in the traditional setting, uh, bin non-binary, as you increase the field size, it will keep outperforming the binary, right? But see, what is interesting in this setting, given the other constraints of the system, is that uh, it is not a, sort of a monotonic gain, and this now creates an opportunity to create uh, uh, new types of codes for this uh, new application. So another result that I'm also excited about that I'd like to share with you today is um, an alternative approach. It has a bit more of a kind of algebraic flavor to it. So I'll describe that one next. So um, given that we are doing um, given that we are doing uh, privacy amplification after information reconciliation, now the question is, do I really need the entire X? And uh, the, as it turns out, the answer is no, because we are, also, we are looking at certain entropy conditions in the end. And so I only, it only suffices for me to look at the subset of facts that would give me the same uh, key in the end, given the uh, entropy constraints. So uh, what that really means, if we revisit this now again from the first principles, we can revisit our uh, setup again. So we have a parity check matrix H, which has two components. I'll call them H1 and H2. And let's assume for the moment that H2 itself is uh, full rank. It's a, it's a square matrix, M by M. And so uh, if you um, look at this syndrome, which is X times, uh, excuse me, H times X, so you just write that out. Now, if H2 is... Um, full rank uh, square matrix, then you can extract the X2 component from, uh, uh, from the rest uh, using uh, matrix uh, operations. And so, um, but if X2 is a function of X1 given the structure of X itself, then we can preserve this um, um, entropy condition just with respect to X1, what we would have normally for X. So, uh, uh, so the observation is here, um, uh, you know, if you are going to only, uh, if you, our, our ultimate goal is to get this uh, K, which is a compressed version of X, really it suffices to only look at X1 because X2 is a, uh, a, a direct function of X1. So this is not something you would have in a traditional setting where you need to decode the entire code or you need to look at the entire thing. And so, but in the spirit, you may think of this as um, in systematic decoding, where you have the systematic part of uh, your code word and then the parity part. So in the spirit, it's similar to that. And so um, now what actually happens is this opens up an algebraic question, is that how can, I, how can we test for the existence of this property? And as it turns out, there could be multiple subsets that satisfy this property. And here's just an, as an example. So uh, um, so if I'm looking at a set of LLRs, um, uh, looking, uh, remember, I don't need the entire X to eventually give me that K. Um, I am only looking at those that carry the most information given that they correspond to uh, my uh, uh, X one. And so this is just for illustrative purposes. Uh, we are looking at two options. There is a set one. I'm looking at the sum of the absolute values in the LLRs. So the higher the values are, whether positive or negative, the more confident we are in that value versus set two. So you would pick set two versus set one in this example. But in any case, uh, here you, you have a choice of which four out of these six uh, uh, you can pick. So you pick the one with the highest um, confidence in this case, this is how we call it. And so, um, uh, so it doesn't matter uh, whether you pick, uh, uh, I should say that the final condition on the entropy doesn't change whether you pick X or X1 as long as X2 uh, is a um, uh, direct function of X1. And so we would just look at the subset that has the highest confidence. 
All right, so uh, this actually becomes quite reminiscent of things we uh, uh, know about. So what are, what are the possible coding solutions? So first, we know for MDS, you can select a lot of subsets. That is the definition of the MDS code. You can call it, select any size K uh, subset. And um, given that we also want to extract the LLR um, values, um, uh, we, there is certainly inherent complexity in choosing the uh, MDS codes in, in that setting. On the other hand, we can go back to LDPC codes, as we discussed already. Uh, they're equipped with their own advantages in terms of decoding, uh, but uh, LDPC codes, as they are, may not immediately satisfy this constraint uh, that we are interested in. And so now solution becomes, again, in the spirit of the first part of the talk, something that will uh, take both from, um, <laughs> from MDS and from LDPC. So we call them block MDS uh, quasi-cyclic LDPC codes. And so uh, uh, this is our candidate code design. Um, so we have a parity check matrix. Um, Okay, we have a parity check matrix, uh, which is highly structured. And so for us, the C's are going to be uh, circulant matrices. Um, and so, and um, these are non-binary codes. So you have a scaling in front of the circulant uh, that is captured by the set S. And then you have powers of the circulants, which is captured by the uh, set P. And so there is this is a highly structured construction, and it would uh, certainly as such have a lot of practical uh, benefits. Um, these, we previously, in a di completely different setting, studied um, ensemble average um, properties of, of uh, such matrices. So we're going to focus here on um, a more refined regime. All right, so um, what we want for us is, excuse me, is this block MDS uh, property where we want, um, we say that a scaled quasi-cyclic LDPC code is block MDS if every uh, square submatrix in the photograph, the original small graph that you have on the left, results in a full rank matrix when lifted. So here is an example of uh, first and third on the right, then first and second then uh, second and third, and we want all of these to result in a full rank matrix. That goes back to that H2 uh, being a square and full rank. And so for us, now this becomes a set of algebraic conditions. So uh, this is something that is previously known in the literature on quasi-cyclic codes, partly known. And um, we can define a polynomial that um, uh, that depends on our two sets of parameters, S, which is this non-binary scaling factor in front of the circulants, and P is the power to which you raise the circulant. And so for us, uh, we have a sufficient condition. Uh, first condition is about the quasi-cyclic part, and second condition is our own condition. Uh, and uh, if that condition, which is not hard to check, if it's satisfied, uh, we will have our block. And so as it turns out, um, uh, this condition, so I previously said it's sufficient, uh, and this becomes necessary in a special case. So together it becomes necessary and sufficient, in particular for the codes that have um, uh, particular values of the girth. So what happens here as a result in the class of all quasi-cyclic LDPC codes, um, in other settings, more uh, conventional settings, you might be interested in high girth quasi-cyclic LDPC codes. But here, um, we're also interested in these block MDS quasi-cyclic codes because we want that particular algebraic property to be satisfied. And we also want code to have structure. So for the implementation reasons, and then as it turns out, we actually can achieve that. There is a non-trivial intersection here, this green part. So uh, uh, we can have a code that has all these all right, so um, uh, for us, uh, uh, this now becomes a choice of how um, um, this is a bit still work in progress. We have uh, observed that, so the powers of the circuit, uh, excuse me, the size of the circulants is, um, uh, is going to be a prime, and these conditions we checked, they are not satisfied for all choices of primes, but they are sufficiently dense, so we can always have a good choice. We believe it's true more generally than this necessary, uh, than this sufficient condition that we have. So that's still a bit of work in 
this, but I just want to show this result. Oops, sorry. Uh, so uh, uh, what this plot shows is that um, uh, if we are doing our um, um, secret key generation, uh, it is uh, sufficient to only decode from one subset, your best subset, as opposed to doing the full decoding. Uh, So that that itself is a promising result that we have so far. Um, so at this point, um, I'd like to summarize the results that we have. Um, okay, so uh, we've seen um, sort of, sort of uh, two takes on improving um, error correction for uh, QKD. This has been um, sort of a novel uh, endeavor for us. Uh, this has been a significant interest on the uh, on the implementation side of things. Now, uh, folks are able to actually implement these uh, high, what they refer to as high-dimensional QKD protocols. Uh, and previous work uh, focused on um, not structured binary codes. And so we are now looking at different ways in which that can be improved. So we have both a um, result that is on non-binary LDPC codes that are optimized for a specific cho choice of channels uh, that was uh, motivated by our implementations. And then we also have more of an algebraic uh, take on things that uh, uh, leverages um, certain new properties of the parity check matrix that we have introduced. And we believe that in the future, some of these ideas can be combined for a sort of more so with that, um, 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 take a step back. Uh, of course, we are very familiar with the traditional channel code design problems. You have an easy channel, you have an encoder, you have a decoder. Uh, your message uh, is encoded and then uh, passed through a uh, noisy channel as such, and then you need to reconstruct it. And um, uh, so this, these type of problems are still dear to my heart. Uh, we are, as a channel coding uh, uh, community, this, there's no shortage of problems to work on. This is a, a workshop on applications of uh, channel coding, and here is an application. <laughs> and so uh, uh, what actually is very exciting for us is that new systems, QKD as an exemplar, uh, have uh, presented uh, new constraints and so as a result, uh, coding schemes that served us well in other domains are not appropriate anymore. And so it gives us a sort of a motivation to rethink some of these designs. And so uh, there's sort of a sequence of new technical tools that we have developed um, uh, uh, towards establishing new uh, code design um, solutions here. And it's sort of very exciting to see also this being implemented in practice. And um, if you're interested in how QKD works, I, I'll also refer you to a, a recent magazine paper that we had, which also outlines some additional problems that um, folks in our community might be interested in. Uh, thank you. I have one question. So in the, in the, I guess, older style or traditional systems, right, you get just a binary sequence. So I guess you describe it here, you might get more. And so indeed, you get a select and move problem. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. And so you do it with this, uh, what you describe. However, in the, in the binary case that I know, um, the channels are not symmetric. And so if you really want to get to the thing, you have to do something closer to what John Luigi does. So you, know, you have to also do because it, you know, channel is not symmetric. Channel is not symmetric here. In fact, channel is uh, has a uniform component, Gaussian component. So I just presented this as a conditional probability p of y given x. But all of these um, physical impairments and constraints that come from the actual generation, key generation, generation of our common texture. And so maybe just one question. So one thing I was still puzzled by your search that that you're not, you're not optimal at, at, the, at the premier rate being zero, right? Yeah. Now. But that's it. You talk about some finite length effect? Um, yes, these are finite length codes. They, I mean, they have to be. This is a specific code that you're going to do. They have to be finite length codes. I mean, you have to generate the key at the end of the day. 
Right, but you know, the, the systems, okay, I've been involved. Uh, yeah, I think, so what, uh, so the, so, uh, so you have a very steep thing, so... Right, so uh, looking at from the uh, looking from the practical perspective, what uh, folks are interested in are talking to the implementation side, they're looking at low read codes and a code line for the lower towns because there are other constraints in the system that they need to follow. So we have a chart in terms of paper in December. Uh, but we use uh, in Salomon and the uh, heavy short line codes, and we also have um, capacity, the uh, mutual information, and how much it achieves it. I don't, I'm not sure if you mentioned it here, but uh, I, I, I did not. <laughs> but, uh, the encoder does not know P of Y given X, so you can't really shape the information, the no, distribution. No, no, Actually, no, the encoder knows P of Y given X. We have yeah. done it. I mean, that's in all the channels. Yes, you're right. But, uh, but in, in typically, you know, when you actually do it, you typically have only time to do a, you know, expand to do a single one because it's too expensive because probably, you know, I haven't thought about it. I'm also, I'm sorry, when you say you know the channels, this, this particular, like, what we did was time in time of your picking. So the, the channel may depend on the detector. You know from the characteristic of the detector what your uh, channel is going to be. Um, yeah, it's like so then, because it may be the qubit parallelization, because this experiment is very unique. It's the tiny time. Typically, in multi level coding, you do union bound over the layers. But here, you don't operate near zero. So maybe you need another technique. Or what do you use for the error probability? Uh, for the error probability, so the, uh, ultimately, the, uh, uh, what is of interest to us is the information reconciliation, so the rate, final rate that we get, and that depends on what the code is and the rate of the code, but also how good we, how good the code is. No, but the FVR, how do you get it? Uh, that, 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 that is what you do from the experiment. So or, or, you know, if, if, since these time detectors, they are not, they have a jitter. Yeah. Um, and, and so they tell you, if you buy a detector, there is a characterization, you know, there is a Gaussian kind of curve. So from there, this is your noise. So, uh, yeah. Because they don't agree, Bob, uh, Alice and Bob, they read uh, the time a little bit differently. So there is an inherent difference. I mean, these are not, uh, you know, perfectly aligned. Uh, there is... Uh, mm -hmm different sources of noise. You cannot detect the uh, in two consecutive bins because of the delays and so forth. And there is impairment of the, uh, how the generator creates the um, uh, these entire of photon pairs. So this is, uh, this is sort of, at this point, it's like coding theory as we know it, meaning, meaning practice where it stands. And so they are working very hard in overcoming a variety of these uh, physical impairments, but there is a limit to how much of this can be overcome. And so we need to operate within the constraints of that. So there is mathematical modeling for that combination, usually mixture chain, all that is going on in programs. Actually, uh, the thing that you don't know uh, for these detectors is that they have downtime. So they introduce the memory. And if you want to have a key, it has to be perfectly random, and it has to be equal on both sides, right? And it's not perfectly random because of this downtime. So the detector detects a photon and goes to sleep. So that part hasn't been addressed yet, how to reconcile for that. Um, of course, you can do it based on experiment, but um, for other, there are specifications. In the One last question. So uh, see, you talked about this problem that for like MDS codes have lots of Information sets in like any end use k, uh, but like for example, a basic just a cyclic code, any k consecutive uh, locations will give you an information set. But I want to have more than one choice because I don't know which one will be the best in my given setting. No, I'm just saying. So, like the quasi-cyclic example you gave, is it like following from that? So quasi-cyclic. Uh, so we are restricting ourselves to a class of quasi-cyclic codes with an additional property of being a block MDS. Okay, and that block MDX you, you can view it as having been inherited from MDS. But it's 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 a MDS, and so at the point where how you generate the LDPC code, at what point do you request it to be MDS? Oh, right. <coughs>
like, lara 